I'd like to welcome everybody to the first class in the Intro to Case Writing course at FAST. What we're going to be doing in this first class are two things. Number one, I'd like to introduce you to the CP, and I'd like to give you an understanding of what the CP entails, and most importantly, how it's marked. Very, very important to understand how the CP is marked in order to do well on the exam. So we will spend a lot of time focusing on that. After we've talked about what the CP entails and how it's marked, we'll then spend the remainder of our session talking about techniques for writing CP cases. You'll then have a chance to apply those techniques when you write four cases throughout the course. And you'll be writing your first, your first case already next week. Any time during the session, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt me and ask. I'll be very, very happy to answer your question. I have uh, absolutely no desire to do a soliloquy. So let's get started, guys, by talking about the three days of the CP. I think you all know the CP is a three-day exam. Day one is a four-hour case, which is based on the same case that you're going to be doing in Capstone 1. I imagine that most of you are on your way to Capstone 1 in May. And during Capstone 1, you'll be working on a big business case. When you get to the first day of the CP, you'll have a four-hour case based on the same company that you're working on in the Capstone 1 module. In the Capstone module the, that you're going to be working on as a group starting in May, the company you're dealing with will be facing a particular scenario. When you come to your CP on day one, the same, con same company will be facing a new scenario. So familiarity with the case will be there already. You'll be very, very familiar with the actual company from having worked on Capstone 1. This effectively is a continuation of what you've done in Capstone 1. Now, keep in mind that day one of the CP is very, very non-technical. What they're testing on day one of the CP is high-level business skills. Your analytic skills, your decision-making skills, your communication skills, etc. But it's very, very non-technical. And that's what they mean when they say the focus is on enabling top competencies rather than technical. Day one is marked completely separately from days two and three. You can pass day one without passing days two and three, or you can pass days two and three without passing day one. Okay. And uh, yeah, um, Shia, I, I'm, I'm having a, sorry, trying to read that. Sanja asks, we'll all get the same case for Capstone 1. Yes, you'll all be working on the same case for Capstone 1, and that will be the same case that's tested on the CV. Okay. Um, when you all go, all of you are going to Capstone 1, this May will be working on the same case. Now, days two and three, let's talk about those. Day two and three are the technical days of the CV. Day two is the five-hour elective comp. And another term that I'm going to be using during this session is roll comp. Elective comp and roll comp are synonyms. The reason it's called a roll comp is this is the one day on the CP where you choose a particular role. And there's a choice from four roles. You can choose the assurance role, taxation role, finance role, or performance management role. Now, it makes a large difference what role you choose. The reason why it makes a large difference what role you choose is because of the way that it's designed. Um, Ron, I'm going to come back to your question in just a moment. The way that it's designed is as follows. The role comp or elective comp is going to test financial accounting and or management accounting. So there will be some required that entail financial accounting and or management accounting, and everybody will have to address those requirements. Those requires will be common to everybody writing. The remainder of the requires that you need to address on the role comp will depend on your role. So let's say I choose assurance as my role. I may have to deal with financial accounting and or management accounting. It'll be, it could be just one of the two or it could be both. And then the remainder of the requires that I need to deal with will all be assurance. On the other hand, if I choose taxation as my role, then I'll have to deal with financial accounting and or management accounting. But now all of the remaining requires will be in taxation. That is how the role comp works. That's why you have to choose your role before you enter the role comp, because what you're going to be doing on that comp will differ. Now, how do they design a comp where different people will be addressing different requires? The way that they designed it is as follows. 
when you see the comp, what they're going to do is they're going to give, there'll be different subheadings for each of the roles. And so there'll be an assurance subheading and you'll have all the required the assurance people need to deal with. They'll do the same for tax, finance, and performance management. Then there'll be some common information that everybody has to read. So there'll be some appendices that everybody has to read. And then there'll be a separate appendix for each role. So let's say I choose the assurance role. I'll read all the common information that everybody has to read, plus a special exhibit for the assurance people. The guy next to me who's doing tax, what he'll do is he'll read the same common information that I read, but he'll also have a special exhibit just for tax. Everybody with me? So that's how they're able to give people the information they need to address their requirements. Okay? Um, now, Ron, if you don't mind, your question, if I could deal with it after class, I'd appreciate it. Um, just remind me, please. Victoria, um, can someone pass one and three or one and two, or, or are two and three treated as one? Uh, Victoria, two and three are treated as one. So you cannot pass one and three. In other words, you can pass day one on its own, and you can pass day two and three on their own. But that's it. Two and three are like one unit, and day one is another unit. Okay. Now, <clears throat> moving on to day three. Whereas day two is one big five-hour case, day three so far has always had three cases. And the three cases have always added up, will always add up to 240 minutes. So instead of giving you one big five-hour case, they could give you three cases that are 80 minutes each, or they could give you one case that's 90, another that's 70, as long as it all adds up to 240 minutes. Now, on day three, as opposed to day two, on day three, as opposed to day two, you don't choose a role. Everybody writes exactly the same cases. So because you don't choose a role, they can, they can only test subjects, they can only test assurance, tax, finance, and performance management at the core level. In other words, on day two, if I choose assurance, it's fair game to test assurance at the elective level because I chose assurance as my role. If the girl next to me chose taxation, she can be tested on tax at the elective level. But on day three, because everybody is writing the same cases, they can only test at the core level because nobody specializes. Everybody's writing the same cases. So assurance will only be tested at the core level. Tax will only be tested at the core level. Tax. Um, there seems to be another question. I'm having a little trouble reading the names. Um, this is from Hannah. What about reset? Okay, for people who are resitting day one, uh, if you don't mind, let's talk about that after class. Okay, because that's a special situation. It doesn't apply to most people in the class. So if you don't mind, at the end of class, we'll discuss that. Okay, any other questions? Any other questions? Okay, so let's move on then. Now, the most important thing for you to understand about the CP right from the start is that the CP tests the candidate's ability to demonstrate competency rather than simply testing knowledge. Very, very important to realize that. So at the end of the day, what does this really mean? What it really means is what you see in the first bullet. And this is the crux of what the CP is all about. Basically, the CP is testing your ability to apply knowledge and not simply recite it. Simply reciting knowledge on a CP buys you absolutely nothing. At the end of the day, you can recite everything you know about a particular subject, but if you don't apply that knowledge to the case facts, you will not do well. The CP is all about taking the knowledge you have and applying it to case facts. Whether it's knowledge of gap, whether it's knowledge of gas, whether it's knowledge of tax, it doesn't matter. The crux of the CP is application of knowledge, case facts. And it's very, very important to get your mind about that, around that right from the start. Now, before I go further, there seems to be another question. The question says, does that mean that the examinee does not have to write other roles other than the selected one? Yes, what, on day two, you only choose one role. So as I said before, you still will have to address financial accounting and or management accounting. It'll either be one, or the, uh, one, of, one of the two or both. That everybody will have to do. But aside from that, you will only have to address your role. So if I chose assurance as my role, aside from management accounting and financial accounting, I will just have to deal with the assurance required. I will not have to worry about tax. 
Um, so I have another question here from, from Seja. Um, yes, Seja, you, you'll be asked in advance by CPA Ontario to, to what role you've chosen. So you do have to choose your role in advance, okay? And you'll have an opportunity to do that. Okay, let's continue onward, guys. We'll just see if there's any other questions, and then we can continue onward. Okay, so, um, yeah, no, Victoria, Victoria is asking, will you be testing a financial or management account on a day two or both? Now, that's what I was saying earlier, Victoria. You, you, it, it depends on some years, they only test the financial accounting. That was the case in 015 and 016. But in 017, they tested financial accounting and management accounting. So there's really three scenarios. They can test just financial accounting, just management accounting, or both. Okay? And all of, so you've got to be ready for, for all of these scenarios. Okay? Let's see what else there is here. Yeah. Somebody was saying, by the way, that uh, you would choose your you would choose your role when you register for capstone two. That makes a great deal. That makes a great deal of sense. That the, that makes a great deal of sense. And I, I've heard the same thing. The reason why you need to choose your role before you register for capstone two is it affects the comps you're going to be writing in capstone two. So CPA Ontario or CPA Canada would have to know your role before you go to capstone two. So that makes sense. That would that would make sense. Someone else said that they chose that you would choose your role. Um, when you register for the CP in May. So again, I, one way or the other, you're going to choose your role well in advance of the uh, well in advance of the CP. Okay. Um, okay, um, guys. Some people are asking about scenario, about scenarios with Capstone One. Again, let's deal with that at the end because these are unique scenarios that don't apply to most people. Okay, and I'm trying to address things that apply to most people now. After class, we can address unusual situations. Okay, let me see if there's any other questions. Um, Benish asks, the role that we don't choose, even those we have to study in detail. Benish, I'm going to answer that question uh, when we look at the competency map in just a few minutes. In just a few minutes, I'll talk about what level you need to know subjects if you have not chosen them as your role. Okay, so I will address that. Okay. Okay. I'm going to see if there are any other questions I haven't answered. Okay, somebody asked, so it doesn't matter if a person passes day one so long as they pass day two and three. Now, at the end of the day, to get your CPA, you need to pass all three days. But let's say you fail day one, but you pass day two and three. The good news is that you only have to repeat day one. You don't have to repeat days two and three. So at the end of the day, you have to pass all three days but you don't have to write all three days over again just because you didn't pass day one. I hope that answers your question, okay? Okay. Okay. Um, okay, um, another person asked, when will strategy and governance be tested? Um, it'll definitely, it, it, if you chose performance, man, performance man, ma management as your role, and on day two, performance management really consists of, what I, in my mind, it consists primarily of management accounting and strategy and governance. So if you chose performance management as your role on the role comp, you'd already come up there. If you haven't chosen performance management as your role, then you'll still be tested on it on day three. Okay, so I hope that answers your question. Let's see if there are any other questions here. Um, if you, somebody asks, what if you do in the Masters of Accounting program and not doing Capstone 2? So all Capstone 2 is, is basically writing practice basis. So presumably, Victoria, if you're exempted from Capstone 2, it's because you're doing the equivalent at your university. That's the, that's the whole idea. Effectively, you are doing Capstone 2, you're just doing it through your university. Okay. Um, and let's see if there's anything else. Okay. Okay, so let's uh, let's let's continue. Okay, the CP covers the same six competencies that you were responsible for for the core modules. I realize that there are many people here who didn't have to do the core modules, but for those of you who did do the core modules, the technical knowledge you need will be similar to the technical knowledge that was required for the core modules. 
And again, the same six competencies, audit and assurance, financial reporting, management accounting, finance, taxation, strategy, and governance, okay? Again, at what level you need to know these subjects, that I will address in just a moment, okay? And we've reached that moment right now. If you take a look, guys, what you see in front of you is an excerpt from the competency map, okay? And when you look at the competency map, guys, notice the different columns you have. Notice that you've got core columns and then elective columns, okay? So if I want to understand the level of proficiency that is examinable on the CP, I need to, for any particular area, I need to look closely at the competency map, okay? For my, ele for my role, okay, let's say I chose assurance as my role on the role comp. That means I need to know assurance at the elective level. And I would be looking at this column to know at what, in order to determine at what level to know a given subject. If I've chosen tax as my role on the role comp, then I'd be looking at this column to determine at what level I need to know tax on my, on my role comp. For other areas, I pay attention to the core column. So for example, if I chose assurance as my role on the role comp, then for assurance, I'm looking at, I'm looking at this column here, right? I'm looking at the assurance column right here, okay? On the, so if I chose assurance as my role, then when I'm studying assurance, I'm looking at this column, the elective column. But for tax, I'd be working with a core column. And the opposite would be true for somebody who chose tax as their role. If I chose tax as my role, then when I'm then for tax, I would be looking at this column here that I'm circling right now. But when it comes to assurance, I'd be looking at the core column. So you're only using the elective column to determine the level at which you need to know something for the role comp for your particular role. Otherwise, you're paying attention to the core column. No. The next point I want to make is the following. There are two competency maps, the one you see in front of you, which is simply called the CPA competency map. But then there's another competency map called the CPA competency map knowledge supplement. The knowledge supplement, it has far more detail. What the knowledge supplement does is lay out in extreme detail all the different topics that make up a particular competency, and then you can tell, by, and then it'll give a letter to tell you at what level you need to know that. So for example, for tax, it'll tell you capital gains, at what level do I need to know this subject at the core level? At what level do I need to know the subject at the elective level? At what level do I need to know CCA calculations at the core level versus the elective level? I strongly suggest that in addition to looking at the CPA competency map, that you also look at the CPA competency map knowledge supplement. But again, the key thing to remember is pay attention to the elective column just for your role, okay? Very, very important to understand that. Now, some of you might wonder what these letters mean. Notice, for example, uh, you have over here in the, in the core column, you have a C, right? This is, finance, this is just an excerpt from financial reporting. So notice in the core column, you see a C. And in the elective column under assurance, you see a B. What does that mean? Notice that for these first three subjects, you see an A even in the core column. What does that mean, A, B, or C? So let me explain that on the next slide. And please pay close attention to this because if you understand this properly, you can avoid wasting a lot of time. When it comes to the proficiency levels, if something is categorized as level C, what that means is I only need the most basic level of that subject. I don't need to know it in very much detail. So if something is only level C, I just need a very basic, very general knowledge, please spend very minimal time on something if it's level C. If there's a B, that means you already need a decent working knowledge of the subject. And if it's A, it means you really have to understand the complexities of the issue. You really, really have to know the subject very, very well. Now, at the end of the day, it is humanly not possible to differentiate between level B and level A. To me, how do I know where to draw the line between understanding the complexity or having a good working knowledge? Whether something is level A or B, I need a good knowledge of the subject. Whether something is level A or B, 
I need to be able to deal with it both qualitatively and quantitatively at a fairly decent level. So I really would not differentiate between A and B. As soon as something is rated as B or greater, so as soon as it's A or B, I would try to be very comfortable with that subject. To me, the main demarcation would be between level C versus A and B. If it's only level C, I don't waste a lot of time in it. Once it's level B, I want to have a good knowledge of that subject. Now, before I go any further, we were looking earlier at the, at the exam itself. And again, that, this is, what we need to do now is we need to relate back what I just showed you in the competency map to the exam itself. So when it comes to the day two elective comp, I've chosen finance as my role. I better know finance at a pretty high level because I'll be looking at the elective column and the elective column is going to have a lot of A's and B's under finance. There'll be various areas in finance that will only have a C at the core level. So people who didn't choose finance as their depth area will only need to know it at the C level. But that same area will likely have an A or a B under the elective column, meaning that those who chose it, chosen it as their role, they need to know it really, really well. I was saying earlier, now maybe you can relate to this, that on day three, all of these subjects will only be at the core level because day three, everybody is writing the same cases. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody was clear on that. Now, one final point, and then I'll answer the questions. Um, you, I think people are aware of this, but it's worth mentioning. You will have the CPA handbook and the tax act available to you electronically while you're writing the CP through the software that you're provided with called Secure Exam. Now, I don't think you'll find the Tax Act particularly useful because I think most people find it very difficult to read the Tax Act and understand it. So I don't think you'll be using the Tax Act very much, but you will be using your CPA handbook. As a matter of fact, we'll talk about this more when we get into taking up cases, but what a lot of good students will do is they'll often copy rules from the handbook and then they'll tie back to them. So if I'm trying to figure out whether an operation qualifies as a discontinued operation, I might copy the criteria literally from my handbook into my paper and then tie back to case facts. So you will probably be utilizing the handbook quite a bit. But the one thing you don't have time for in the CP is to do research. So you need to know where things are. You can't be doing research on the CP, there's no time for that. But as long as you know where things are, there's nothing wrong with grabbing something from the handbook, pasting it into your paper, and then tying back to whatever the criteria may be. Let me now go back to some questions. Um, so Sally, you know what, you're asking me what the most recent version of it, I don't recall the year. Just go to, go, just go to the CPA website and at the end of the day, um, whatever comes up is the most recent. You're right, they have not updated it in quite a while. So it's, the most recent is not 012, it will be de definitely late, I'm pretty, it'll definitely be later than 012 because there was no CPA in 012. At the bottom line is even the most recent copy that you'll find on the CPA Canada website, even the most, or, or you can just Google it, by the way. The other way to get to the competency map is just in Google, put down CPA competency map or CPA competency map and all the supplement will come up. Even the most recent version is not, it's not that current. They're going to be revamping it shortly, but it's definitely not 2012. Pretty certain because this CP didn't even exist then. Um, Sally, let me take a look at your question. Sally asks, day three require all three not be array? No, no, day three, they can test you at the core level. Even at the core level, certain topics will be A or B. But at the core level, day three is at the core level. At the core level, some of the more difficult topics, the really difficult topics will be C. So for example, let's take tax as an example. Day three, they can only test tax at the core level. So the really complex tax planning will either not be examinable in the core column or only be level C. But the nuts and bolts of tax, the basic tax knowledge, you know, the, what's deductible, what isn't deductible, what's taxable, what isn't taxable, how do I calculate CCA, how do I deal with a capital gain, the basic stuff will be either A or B, even at the core level, and therefore will be examinable at A or B on day three, okay? Now, um, Sally asked, um, the new IFRS is so long, um, the truth is, you're right, for IFRS 15, Sally's asking about, there, you're right, it's going to be difficult. 
you'll, you know, you'll, you'll have to be pretty familiar with it to be able to find what you're looking for. So again, you know, what there you may have to make a judgment call uh, in terms of what part you, what, in, in terms of what you copy or don't copy. But you're right, it will be a little bit more challenging for IFRS 15 and for some of the others. Um, uh, Beanish is asking, do we need C for all electives? I'm not sure what you mean by that. On the electives, Beanish, most topics will be examinable at the A or B level, okay? For the, it, it, when we say for the electives, we said before, the elective column is relevant for the roll comp. So for your roll comp, you're looking at the elective column, there it's going to be mainly A's and B's, very few C's. Okay, so I'm not sure if I I've answered your question or not. I wasn't 100% clear on your question. Let's move on now to the marking of the CP. Very, very important to understand how the CP is marked, okay? Yeah, the question that uh, was just asked is, Monica asks, she says, oh, one only has to write financial reporting and or management accounting and one elective, no other elective. That is correct, Monica. So if I've chosen assurance as my elective, what I'm really doing is financial accounting and or management accounting and assurance. I'm not dealing with tax, I'm not dealing with finance, et cetera. Just one elective, okay? And Ramon says the latest competency map is on the website now, that it, that's correct. But again, I don't recall when it was last updated. It wasn't updated yesterday, okay? Um, at the end of the day, I think it was issued and revised in 018, but I, and, and I actually received a note from CPA Canada just recently um, telling me about about revisions, but the revisions were very, very minor. So when I say that the competency map isn't really very recent, all I mean by that is they came up with a competency map at least a couple of years ago, and they've made very, very little revision to it. So when I saw the revisions this year, they were inconsequential, quite honestly. Um, they, they were fairly inconsequential. Um, obviously, every year you're responsible for new gaps, but other than that, they were really inconsequential. So when I say that it hasn't been changed very much, that's what I mean. Apparently, they're going to be making some really wide-ranging major changes uh, in the future. But right now, it's stayed fairly similar over the last couple of years with minor revisions each year. Okay, that's all I meant, Ramon. Okay, let's, uh, let's continue. Marking of the CP. For each CP, guys, different issues or requires will be classified as assessment opportunities. When you have a particular required, they will use assessment opportunities to mark that required. There'll be at least one assessment opportunity associated with a given required, and there may be more than one assessment opportunity. I'll explain a little more clearly later on how these assessment opportunities work. Now, on a multi, there are typically six or seven assessment opportunities that come up. On a roll comp, there are a lot of assessment opportunities. There can be 12 to 14. I think I've even seen as high as 15. The particular number of assessment opportunities that you need to deal with will vary depending on the role. Sometimes one role might have one more assessment opportunity than another. And again, the assessment opportunities relate back to the requires and they're used to mark. And again, I will explain it a little more clearly in just a couple of minutes. Now, in order to ensure that you hit all the assessment opportunities, very vital to fully deal with all of the required. Guys, this is a very, very important thing to keep in mind. At the end of the day, guys, what some students will do, which is a huge, huge mistake, is if there's a very, very difficult required, they might leave it out. And that's a tremendous, tremendous mistake. And the reason why it's a tremendous mistake is every required will have at least one assessment opportunity associated with it. And you want to score well on as many assessment opportunities as possible. You can't afford to give up or discard an assessment opportunity. If you leave out a required, you're literally writing off a whole assessment opportunity. And as you'll see when I show you the passing profile, you really can't afford to do that. Now, the mentality that some students have, which is a completely wrong mentality, is when a difficult required comes up, they'll sometimes leave out the required based on the following logic. They'll say to themselves, why should I spend time on this required? It's such a hard required that I'm going to bomb it anyhow. So I won't get any credit for it anyhow. So what's the point? I may as well leave out this required. I'll lose the assessment opportunity. 
It'll leave me more time to work in other required. And I would have lost the opportunity anyhow. I would have done poorly anyhow. So whether I leave it out or I bomb it, what's the difference? I may as well leave it out and therefore leave myself more time for the other required. The reason why this is a wrong mentality is very, very simple. When they, uh, when they come up with an assessment opportunity, we'll see later on that there are different levels that you can achieve. Ideally, you want to achieve what's called the competent level. And the second best level is reaching competent, okay? There's also something called competent with distinction, but as we'll see later on, it has no impact on whether you pass. So you want to achieve competent, but even if you only get reaching competent, you do get some credit. So some people will have the mentality, if it's a really hard required, I'm not even going to get reaching competent, and therefore I'm not going to get any credit for that AO. Therefore, I may as well spend my time on the other required. The time I would have spent on the AO I would have bombed could now be allocated to the other required. The reason why this is such an erroneous way of thinking is when they set the standard for what you need to do to achieve competent, or what you need to do to achieve reaching competent, it takes into account the level of difficulty. If it's a really, really hard required, the standard for achieving competent will be much, much lower. And if you can breathe, you'll achieve reaching competent. So if you have a really, really hard required, don't leave it out assuming you're going to bomb it. You won't even get reaching competent. You're going to bomb it. Don't make that mistake. If it's a really, really hard required, still deal with it. And there's a good chance that even if you're quite far off from being perfect, you may still get confident. At the very least, you may get reaching confidence, both of which earn you points. So at the end of the day, huge mistake to leave something out because you think you're going to bomb it. If it's really difficult, everybody will find it difficult, and therefore they'll just set, they'll set the standard very low, and you'll probably do a lot better than you thought. Okay? Now. Somebody asks, if I write the easy required first and then the difficult ones, but do not miss any required, is this okay? Yes. It, it, at the end of the day, as long as you don't miss any required, you don't necessarily have to address the required in the order in which they come up. However, having said that, one of the things we'll talk about later in this session is integration. I don't want to jump the gun, but I'll just give you a quick answer for now. Sometimes the requires are intertwined. So there is a logical order in which to attempt them because one required impacts the other. But if they're not intertwined, no, you don't necessarily have to do them in the order in which they come as long as you address them all. Okay, let's move on, guys. Now, as I mentioned a moment ago, when an assessment opportunity comes up, there are five levels that you can technically achieve. There is not addressed, which means you left it out, you didn't even address the required. So if you say to yourself, a required is too difficult, I'm not going to bother to even address it, you will get not addressed, which means you get no credit at all. The next level is nominal competence. Nominal competence is where you addressed it, but very, very poorly. You get no credit at all for nominal competence. Then you've got reaching competent and competent. Again, the level you really want to get is competent. That means you address the required at the level they were looking for. Reaching competent means you weren't quite there. You will get credit for reaching as well as for competent, but as we'll see in a moment, you'll get more credit for competent than for reaching. And then finally, the highest level you can reach is competent with distinction. Now, whether I get competent with distinction or I get just plain old competent, competent with distinction means I did an amazing job but it has no impact on passing the CV. Whether I get competent or competent with distinction has zero impact on whether I pass the CV. The competent with distinction category only matters for the purpose of determining prize winners. It has no impact on whether you pass the suggest. I just want to make that clear. So these are the five levels you'll find for every assessment opportunity. So associated with each required will be at least one assessment opportunity, and these are the different levels you can achieve on a given assessment opportunity. Okay, now that I've shown you the concept of assessment opportunities and the five levels, we're now ready to take a look at how days two and three are marked. Day one is marked totally separately. What I'm addressing now is days two and three. In order to pass the CV, 
you must pass all four levels of the passing profile. Let's take a look now at each of the levels of the passing profile. Level one of the passing profile says, was the aggregate competency demonstrated sufficient? For level one of the passing profile, they're going to look at your performance on days two and three. And what they're going to do is the following. They're going to assign a point system. They're going to give you so many points every time you hit competent on an assessment opportunity. And then they'll give you a lesser number of points every time you hit reach incompetent. They will give you zero points for not addressed or nominal. And they will give you the same number of points whether you get competent or competent with distinction. In order to determine whether you pass level one or not, all they will do is add up all the points that you achieved over days two and three, and if you hit a particular threshold, you pass level one. Please don't ask me what that number is, how many points you need, because it'll vary from CP to CP. There is no magical number. But the one thing I can do to possibly allay people's concerns is to make it very clear that in order to pass level one, you certainly don't have to be getting competent all the time. You're getting competent a lot of the time, but you're also getting some reaching competence. You're still going to likely get enough points to pass level one. You certainly don't need to be getting competent all the time. Okay. Now, Sally asks, what does nominal mean? Um, again, nominal means that you basically, you might have dealt with the required, but you dealt with it very, very, very poorly. And exactly what it means on, will, will differ from case to case. But it basically means you didn't even hit the reach incompetence level. The reach incompetence level usually is not a very high standard. At the reach incompetence level, you might have technical errors. You might not do a great job of finding back these facts. You might do a lot of things not in an ideal way. Nominal means I didn't even hit the reach incompetence level. But again, you'll get a better idea of what this means as we work on cases. I can't just give you a general answer to that. It'll really vary by case. Okay, moving on, guys. I hope everybody understands level one. Now let's take a look at level two. Level two of the passing profile focuses on financial accounting and management accounting. And it says, were the financial accounting or management accounting competencies demonstrated deep enough. So what they're going to do for level two is they're going to look at your performance in financial accounting as well as management accounting over both days two and three. All they're going to focus on for the purpose of level two is how many times did you get competent? They're going to ignore reaching competent. Whereas for level one, reaching competent gets you something, not as many points as competent, but it gets you something. For the purpose of level two, all they're interested in is competent. How many times did you get competent in financial accounting? How many times did you get competent in management accounting? You'll need to get competent a certain number of times in either financial accounting or management accounting in order to pass this level. You don't have to get competent a certain number of times in both. You need to get competent a certain number of times in at least one of these two areas. Okay? Now. Um, Mohammed is asking if all if all you're ever getting is RC, will you pass? I'm afraid the answer is no. Okay, now continuing onward, continuing on, I want to make a very very important point. As long as you get competent a sufficient number of times, and the number of times will vary from exam to exam, as long as you get competent in one of these two areas, financial accounting or management accounting, you get your CPA. However, here is a big however. If you're planning a career in public accounting and it's important to you to get your public accountant's license, then you need to get depth in management accounting, which means you, in financial accounting, excuse me, which means you need to get competent a certain number of times in financial accounting as opposed to management accounting. To get your public accountant's license, you have to choose assurance as your role and you have to get a certain number of competence in financial accounting. Financial reporting is the same thing as financial accountant. So it's possible to pass your CPA without getting your public accountant's license. Let's say I get competent a sufficient number of times in management accounting, but not in financial accounting. I'll pass my CPA, but I won't get my public accountant's license. 
Now, does that mean I can never get my focal talent slices? Of course not. It just means I'll have to write another exam. It means I'll have to write something called a CDPA exam, but I'm not gonna talk about that right now. But let's hope that all of you who do want your public accountant's license will get competent a sufficient number of times in financial accounting. A final point I'd like to make, which is a very important point. Please do not go into this exam saying to yourself, well, I want my public accountant's license, so I don't really care about management accounting. So I'm only gonna make an effort to get depth in financial accounting. I don't care about management accounting because to me, it's the public accountant's license that matters. Or somebody might come into this exam and say, I don't care about my public accountant's license, and what I really care about is management accounting, so I'm only gonna to aim to get enough depth in management accounting. Please don't make that mistake. My strong, strong recommendation is try to get as much depth as you can in both of these areas. Try to get competent as much as you can in both of these areas. Because if you only aim for one area and you don't get it, you're going to fail this exam. Also, you might not know at what point, you know, you, you may not know what point to stop, so to speak. If you say to yourself, oh, I'm only concerned with depth in financial accounting. For management accounting, I can do a little less. What does that mean? I don't know what that means. At the end of the day, aim to do as well as you can on both of these areas. Okay, that's my strong recommendation. Okay, so level two is depth in financial accounting and management accounting. I hope that was clear. Now let's take a look at level three. Level three only focuses on day two. It ignores day three. And it focuses completely on the competency you chose for your role. So let's say I chose assurance as my role. It's gonna, level three will say, did I get enough depth in assurance? Meaning on day two, on the role comp, did I get a sufficient number of competence in assurance? If my friend chose finance as her depth area, and for her, it will be a question, did she get competent a sufficient number of times on the comp in finance? But they're only looking at the comp here. So even if I chose assurance as my role, let's say I chose assurance as my role, and I did a great job of assurance on day three, that's not gonna help me for level three of the passing profile. For level three of the passing profile, they're only looking at my performance on day two. And there's a reason for this, because day two is when they can really test assurance in depth. Day three, they can test assurance in that much depth because day three, they can only test it at the core level because everybody's writing the same cases. They want to see how well you perform on day two when they really tested your, your particular area in depth. The last level of the passing profile is level four. Level four says, was the competency demonstrated broad enough? They'll focus primarily on day three, but there could be some chances on day two. Guys, for level four, all they're trying to see is whether you can demonstrate breadth across all competencies. They wanna make sure that you can at least achieve RC, reaching competence, some of the time on every competency. They wanna make sure that there's no one competency where you know nothing. So let's say I come into the CP. I'm great at a whole bunch of competencies, but I know nothing about tax. I can never get RC in tax. I won't pass level four. Level four is simply saying, we wanna make sure you can get RC a certain number of times across the board, across all competencies. We wanna make sure there's no one area where you know nothing. Is everybody with me, guys? So for level four, RC is good enough. They're not, you don't need to get competent, you just need to get RC. So somebody was asking me earlier, if I only get RC all the time, can I pass the exam? If you only get RC the whole exam on every AO, you're not gonna pass this exam. But let's say there's a particular area that's not your depth area, and you're just not great at it. Let's say my depth area, the area I've chosen in my role comp is assurance. And I'm just not great at tax. I can pass this exam without ever getting more than RC in tax. But I can't pass this exam if I always get nominal in tax, okay? Okay, now Sally is asking me, let me just read her question and then I can try to answer it. She says, do you mean level one equal number of RCs? No, I don't mean that. Level one means they're gonna give you so many points every time you get competent, and more points for getting, sorry, you're gonna get so many points for getting competent on a particular AO and a lesser number of points for getting reaching competence. They're then gonna add up those points and if you have a sufficient number of points, you will pass level one. So for level one, they're looking at both RC as reaching competence as well as competence, okay? Um, now, let me just continue with this question. Level two and level three, 
uh, they're only looking at competent. All that matters for level two and level three is competent. Okay, Sally? And then for level four, all they care is that you got at least RC or better across the board. Okay, that there was no one competency where you could never get beyond RC. Okay, let me look at Shaja's question now. She says, when we have quants in the case study, when we have quants in the case study, and let me just see this here, and the amount that I reach is not right, but the approach was correct, where does that lead me to the competency level? So let me make sure I understand your question. Okay, I think what you're asking me is what if you come down to a wrong number? So again, we're going to talk a lot about this when we work on our cases. But the short answer is very simple. If you do a really good job on the numbers, but let's say you end up with a wrong conclusion. You were supposed to end up with the company breaking even. And because you made a little mistake, they didn't break even. As long as you did a good job on the numbers, even though you came to the wrong conclusion, you may still get competent. If you did a miserable job on the numbers, and as a result of that, you came to a wrong conclusion. You did a terrible job on the break-even, and that's why you said they can't break even when they really could, then you won't do very well. But if you do a reasonably decent job on the numbers, but you just make some mistakes that lead you to the wrong conclusion, you may very well still get competent. But again, we'll talk much more about that as we go through the course, okay? Um, somebody asks, uh, asks, if you fail, I hate to talk about failing, do you learn which areas are areas you are not competent in? They don't give you a huge amount of detail if you, unless you're willing to pay some extra money, okay? They give you, they give you a fairly general stuff. Uh, so again, if, if you want a little, if, I hate to say this, but if, if you want more information on what they give, give you, we can talk about it after class. I really don't want to spend class time talking about the details of what they give people when they fail, uh, but I'm teaching a course to teach people how to pass. Please don't worry about failing, okay? Uh, if God forbid that happens, we, we can talk about it in more depth, okay? Let's continue. Um, so I'm basically through at this point discussing the design of the CFI and how it's marked. Now, what I'd like to do next, and I'm only going to spend a moment on this, I really don't want to spend very much time on this because I don't find it to be particularly important. There is something called the CPA way, and I find that for the most part, you know, it's pretty, it, it's just common sense, it's just basic case writing. So I'm only going to spend a few seconds on this because I don't find it that helpful. When you write a case, of course, you have to assess the situation and analyze major issues. Concluding is very, very important. We'll talk about it in more detail in just a few minutes. You always got to wear, keep the CPA hat on, the CPA mindset, remember professional ethics. You've always got to communicate well. We'll talk more about what that means in just a few minutes. And finally, the basic foundation for your case writing is your technical knowledge. You, technical knowledge alone will not make you pass this exam, but it serves as the foundation for your case writing. In other words, if I have technical knowledge but I don't know how to write cases, that's not going to get me through the exam. But by the same token, if I'm great at case writing but I don't have the technical foundation, I also can't pass the exam. Because the basis of this exam is taking my technical and applying it to cases. So at the end of the day, technical knowledge is very important, but you do need to know how to apply it. This concludes the portion of the session dealing with the CP. The next portion of the session, which will be a new recording, is going to deal with case writing techniques.